You are listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. Welcome to number four in a series called the COVID Leadership Challenge. I'm John Scott, and this is an INCJ podcast and YouTube. COVID-19 is presenting a unique challenge to frontline services, not just in health and, and social sectors, but in criminal justice too. At INCJ, we wanted to find out how leaders internationally were handling the issues around COVID-19. So we've started a conversation with criminal justice leaders to ask about their experience of the crisis. Our hope is that sharing answers will help find solutions and fresh ideas. If you want to follow the series, you will find it on our website at criminaljusticenetwork.net or on Twitter at INTCG Network. Now, let me introduce Michael Nail, who is the Commissioner of the Georgia Department of Community Supervision and is the current president of the National Association of Probation Executives in, in America. I think they call it NAEP. Now, let me welcome Michael. Tell us where you're based. Thank you very much, John, for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you. I'm based out of Atlanta, Georgia. And are you working from home at the minute? Right now, uh, I am in the office, which has been a rarity since March. Now, tell us a bit about Georgia. What's the, what's the population of the state? Uh, population is about 13 million. Okay, and your current job exactly? Currently, I'm commissioner of the Department of Community Supervision. We are responsible for community supervision of all adult felons, either in a probation or a parole status. Now, are all states in America structured this way, or are you a bit different to other states? Uh, we're a bit different. We're one of few where our agency focuses specifically on community supervision. More times than not, you're going to find the supervision arm associated with the Department of Corrections or parole, one of the, the other. So that's what makes Georgia a little bit unique in this. And we're new since 2015 is when our agency was created. So you look after um, people on license when they come out of prison, as well as people have community orders? That's correct. Okay. And was this because your governor wanted to bring the two services together? It was. Uh, we found that there was a lot of duplication of services and efforts. Uh, sometimes people would be supervised in a parole status and a probation status at the same time. So it was really about efficiencies and effectiveness uh, and, and streamlined approach. But what we also realized is now uh, Department of Corrections can focus on managing safe and secure facilities and the parole board uh, can focus on release decision making. And we focus exclusively on supervised supervision of those individuals. OK, now you've got a leadership role both locally in running uh, those community supervision uh, orders, uh, but also you have a, a national job. So you've got leadership with both a national and local perspective. Um, it might be just interesting for our listeners uh, to know uh, how many staff you're responsible for at the moment. Sure. Directly in my current role as commissioner, it's about uh, just over 2,000 staff and 1,500 of those are what we call a law enforcement status. Okay. So that's um, your day job is a big job. Tell us a bit about how NAEP operates. What, sure. what, what does that do? NAEP, of course, the National Association of Professional or Probation Executives, uh, is just as it the title implies. It is a group of uh, executives that specialize in probation or serve in that capacity. Right now, we have about 150 members, uh, which include about 24 different organizations and uh, we represent, or there's representation from about six countries. Okay, and so that would be all across North America or do you include South America too? Uh, North America. Okay, and uh, you share issues relating to management and leadership? We do, we share uh, information relating to management and leadership. We share information regarding trends in the populations we're responsible for supervising. Uh, we share 
new and emerging research uh, that that is being done. Uh, and we also uh, share in making sure that we have a streamlined message of, of what the business of probation supervision should be about. Okay, is there a lot of variety in the way that probation is delivered across the states? I think there's a, a quite a bit of variety. You have some that are, are state level. Uh, you have, of course, some that are federal level. You have some that are county level. But I, I really believe at the end of the day, the roles and responsibilities are about providing services to the individuals under our supervision and, and trying to achieve positive outcomes for them. It may be set up structurally different, uh, and there may be different nuances, but at the end of the day, uh, I, I believe everyone would agree that it's about making individuals, uh, giving them the opportunity to get on the right path and become uh, law-abiding, productive citizens. I, I get it. Okay. Now, 2020 has been a year like no other. Um, should we start by looking at what changes uh, COVID-19 has caused for you at NAEP level? Um, because you've not been able to get together. So how, what impact has that had on NAEP? Well, I think from a NAEP perspective, one thing that we've got to realize is this is new to everyone. Uh, so in essence, it brought things to a halt uh, in regards to NAEP and its normal functioning. What has happened is it is also at the same time uh, brought respective leaders together to share ideas, uh, focus on some of the same challenges that we're having, and uh, more importantly, some of the same solutions or various solutions in dealing with it. So it's, it's, it's refocused a little bit in the present, in the here and now. Uh, that's what NAEP is, is focused on now, uh, but also looking forward, uh, knowing that there will be an end to this pandemic and, and staying the course of what we were really originally charged to do. Okay. Um what have you had to change then? What's had to drop off the agenda for NAEP? Well, th this is interesting. I, th I think one of the things that, that has changed from NAEP's perspective is uh, we, we really don't meet in person anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. Just as most uh, individuals are doing, most meetings are, are of course, virtual. Uh, that certainly has some, some benefits and, and also uh, perhaps some some downfalls. Uh, of course, we try to convene at conferences where you have individuals involved in the same profession. Of course, that is that is stopped. So we've had to readjust. Uh, then you look at things like membership. Uh, you, you've got to find different ways to reach out from a membership perspective and uh, do things a little different that way. Uh, so that that is that has changed, and I think it's somewhat streamlined the focus specifically on the pandemic, at least for now. Okay. okay. How have you shared the present, the, what's happening now, the new practices? How have you shared that? I think primarily over over email has been it, uh, phone calls. Uh, you know, you, you're going to have an organization and a, and a network of professionals, and within that organization, you always have folks that will have a, a strong relationship with others. Maybe they're similarly situated in their agency size uh, or mission. And I think that that is, is one of the things that it's, it's created a closer relationship amongst the members, more individual now than, than broad based. I, I get it. What have been the biggest challenges for you as, uh, as a national leader? Learning how to navigate uh, in this environment, uh, seeing what uh, individuals respond to, understanding the dynamics. Uh, when you talk about uh, letting folks know what the value of NAEP is to them, uh, but also with that in the pandemic, uh, several agencies throughout the nation have undergone budget cuts. Uh, so they uh, stopped uh, memberships of uh, professional organizations. So finding a way to navigate around that and still communicate a unified message of, of what this profession is about. So with budgets being squeezed, uh, you've had to find a way of saying, look, 
stay in stay in NAEP because we can give you uh, guidelines, we can give you support mechanisms. There's still value in being a member of NAEP. Absolutely, with, without a doubt. Uh, I'm wondering whether being a local leader helps you with that. Uh, have you found that having the two jobs has been important? I, I, I think it, it helps. Uh, Georgia has, uh, if not is, uh, is one of the uh, largest community supervision agencies uh, just by the number of individuals under supervision. I think that helps you, you operate and lead from more of a macro level. Uh, and, and that gives you a little bit different perspective. But what I also find is the challenges, especially around uh, the pandemic, the challenges are the same for all of us in this profession. We're all uh, struggling to find the best way to carry out our mission. Uh, so I, I look at it as, as just maybe um, broadening my scope, if, if you will. But I definitely think they, they are parallel, without a doubt. Okay. With Georgia, uh, and you've got thousands of offenders that one way or another uh, you're, you have community responsibilities for, have your staff uh, had to find new ways of providing supervision and accountability for their, for their work? Sure. Of course, at the initial stage of the pandemic, we ceased all field uh, interactions and uh, that changed the way we do business. Uh, we've had to go, go uh, to mainly virtual interactions uh, and we've had to have a heavy reliance on technology. I will say we were uh, way ahead in that, so it wasn't too big of a change. In fact, that's what led us as an agency uh, to be able to carry out our, our mission in spite of the pandemic. But I think the utilization of technology, uh, dealing with individuals that we supervise that may not have access to the technology or the knowledge to utilize the technology if they did have access to it. So it's created those challenges. I think that's one thing. I, I think uh, working uh, certainly flexible schedules, uh, working from home instead of going to a place to work, but again, uh, fortunately, in Georgia, we were already accustomed to doing that, uh, but that, that, that is certainly a challenge that is, is uh, within the pandemic. That's what we're finding. What about offenders that perhaps were, uh, didn't have iPhones or smartphones or were uh, uncertain about how to use technology? How did you overcome that difficulty? Well, interestingly enough, we, we approached it from not as a component of supervision, but we, we approached it as a way to introduce and help them refine a new skill set. Uh, technology is so integrated in what we do day in and day out. So it's not as if they would need this technology for supervision. They, they need it now in a very uh, technology-oriented environment and world. So we approached it that way. And there were cases that we would have to spend a little bit more time on working a, a smartphone uh, or a computer, uh, but we have not had any cases where we were unable to address it or to find workarounds. Uh, that's, that's the good thing. But that's a lens we look through is this is something for them. This is another tool in their toolbox. Okay. Have your staff brought particular emotional or mental health problems to you? Uh, let's start maybe not from a client or a, an offender perspective. Sure. Uh, I, I think your well-being of staff as a leader should always be uh, on, on your mind and, and always checking to make sure that your staff are, are doing well. And I, I know from a personal level, I think about how the pandemic has affected me. We're all in a sense of change there's heightened anxieties, uh, there's heightened worry. Um, so if, if I have those, certainly our teammates and our staff are going to be dealing with those as well. So I think the first thing is to be cognizant of it. But there's an added layer. Now they're having to worry about their family, 
their own personal safety. They're having to worry about making decisions. Should my child stay home for school or should my child go to school? So there's an added layer of, of worry that they take on. And I, I think as a leader, we've got to be cognizant of that. We've got to stay tuned in uh, to the individuals we're responsible for. And more importantly, be able to provide the resources that they may need through these challenging times. Yeah, and the same is true of the offenders or the clients themselves, isn't it? That they are having exactly the same set of doubts and worries. Yes. Are you encouraging your staff to discuss those with the offenders? Ab- absolutely. Uh, you, you know, our staff are reminded at least on a weekly basis of, of the, the what we think are simple things, but wear a mask, wash your hands, watch your distance. Uh, we need to convey those that we supervise uh, to the same things. I think we've got a, a responsibility to help to inform them, to educate them, to make sure they have an understanding, but also to ask them how they're doing during this pandemic and how they're adjusting and how they're coping. So I, I think that's the one thing is, is this pandemic is applicable to everyone. And just because they're under our supervision, that certainly does not mean uh, they're immune from the same feelings we have. Do you, do you think it's affecting the working relationship between uh, uh, probation or parole staff and their uh, clients? Interestingly enough, I, I think it's affecting it, but I think it's affecting it in a positive way. Uh, because you're having more conversation, we're all going through this together. And I think that's what makes this totally unique is that the challenges our officers are having in their personal life with the pandemic is the same challenge that these offenders under our supervision are having. And so there's a, there's a bit of commonality there. And then when we talk about the video interactions, uh, interestingly enough, we're spending more time with our offender. When we were looking at field contacts, on average, it was about six minutes uh, because there are so many distractions around. Well, field interactions, we're finding out we're spending about 23 minutes. So there's more engagement. There's more dialogue. And then we surveyed the actual individuals under our supervision, and they revealed the same thing through the survey, that they actually felt a better connection with their officer. They felt that the officer was more in tune to their issues and concerns and what they were going through, not just with the pandemic, but but overall. So they're getting more time uh, face-to-face through their iPhone or through their uh, computer than they were if they were doing uh, a visit at the office or, or at the home. Yeah, absolutely. And it's created more time for the officer to do that. Uh, before, let's say it, it, it was not uncommon, certainly in rural parts of the state where somebody would drive 45 minutes to make a, a contact with an individual. Well, driving back, that's an hour and a half to make that one six minute interaction. And now in that hour and a half span, you can have interaction, quality interaction with easily four, five, six individuals under supervision. So it's created more time for the officer to be more effective. Yeah, and presumably better for the environment as well. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, If we come back to the challenges uh, that your organization has faced, uh, do you feel that the organization will just go back to the way it was before, or do you think that new ideas will, will change the way that your organization operates? That's a very good question, John. I, I think I, I had an individual on our team put it like this. This is not the new normal. This, this is a new opportunity. And there are things associated with a pandemic that actually we call silver linings. Uh, for the example that I just gave you with video interactions, that's extremely positive. Uh, we have found a new way. Why would we want to go back? Uh, even from a central office and an administrative perspective, we have found more efficient, effective ways to utilize technology, being forced to utilize technology. So when you're still accomplishing the same thing uh, from home, for instance, and maybe even more efficient or effective, why would we be paying so much lease or rent space? 
uh, for brick and mortar. Uh, so there are opportunities because then perhaps what if you reduce that and reinvest it in programming for the individuals under supervision? Uh, so there are a lot of opportunities here, and, and I think that's going to be for our profession a, a game changer. And that is one of the things that Nate is, is focusing on. What, what have we learned lesson wise and, and what do we need to sustain as a result? Are there any innovative uh, pr probation practices uh, that have emerged through COVID-19 that you could share with us? I think uh, we, we're all familiar with telemedicine and telehealth. I think telecounseling, uh, operating groups uh, uh, virtually and, and not having to be gathered, but these individuals are still getting their services that they needed by way of counseling, whether it be uh, substance abuse treatment, mental health uh, treatment, cognitive restructuring. Uh, that is something that has emerged that I'm, I'm not so sure we really gave any attention or thought to doing uh, that that has really, really been extremely beneficial for us. So is that uh, using group techniques through Zoom meetings, that sort of thing? Exactly, Zoom, Google Hangout, whatever the platform is, absolutely. And doing cognitive behavioral change programs one-to-one -one just with the computer or sure. different things to that? Sure, and, and I would not suggest to you that this will replace the personal aspect of it, uh, but we do know it is another option and another viable option for us. So that is something that we have found out during this. Okay, now you mentioned the role of, uh, of Nate in, in sort of looking at the, uh, the national uh, sphere. Are people sharing probation practice developments through, through NAEP as well? Yes, uh, it, through, through NAEP, through our, our membership and, and network sharing ideas, uh, through our publication uh, that will focus on that, through our website, uh, and also using NAEP as, as another reference point for other perhaps associations or organizations that are sharing information. Okay. It's intriguing, particularly sitting in Europe, to think that uh, NAEP has a link with other parts of, uh, of America. So your Canadian colleagues, are they handling uh, COVID in a different way? Because I don't think they have as intense experience uh, of, of, of the pandemic as you're ex having in, in America. Right. And, and I'll tell you, John, I, I would be less than honest if I told you that there has been enriching dialogue uh, with other countries. Uh, I think right now our focus has been on the states, uh, but uh, I, I think there is an opportunity to learn from those other countries. Uh, but I think also it presents a challenge because other countries are perhaps dealing with the pandemic in a far different way, whether it's lockdowns, shutdowns, mandates. Uh, so I think that's why we just have, have gravitated to what our country uh, here in the States are, are going through. Right. To a certain extent, America is a, is a, is a a continent in itself, isn't it? So the, the different sh states sharing is, uh, is important. Exactly, and, and even more so now during the pandemic, without a doubt. Do you think NAEP will go back to the way it was before? I, I don't think so. I think because what the pandemic has, has created is an environment to share information, an environment to learn, uh, new best practices and perhaps learn uh, practices that we need to steer away from. Uh, I think this is a golden opportunity for us to, to share with, this is, this is the only organization where probation executives exclusively are members and share ideas specifically related to our field. And that's what makes us unique. Mm -hmm. Well, you've got to hold on to the uh, USP, haven't you? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to reflect a, a little bit more about the impact of COVID on you as an individual. Mm -hmm. uh, has anything made you rethink your approach to work, Michael? 
It, it has. It, it actually, I try to look at the positives in everything. I think it is, has uh, grounded me a bit more. I think it has shown me the value of perhaps time instead of things uh, to be where your feet are. I think it's taught me a little bit more. Um, it's it's kind of ratcheted back the pace. And a lot of times what I've realized is the pace of things moving so quickly, there was a, a, a lot of activity that may not have been yielding outcomes. So it's made me to personally reflect on how am I utilizing my time. It's made me personally reflect on relationships with friends, with family members, with coworkers uh, to to a great degree. And uh, were you spending a lot of time in airplanes before? Not a great deal, but certainly in a car traveling around the state. Uh, but but usually maybe once a month flying out of the state uh, and, and but but most of my time on the road in Georgia visiting different offices and, and individuals throughout the state. And have you missed the personal contact though? I mean we've talked about saving time in a car but uh, the downside of not visiting those offices is that you might become a more distant or remote figure. Yes I, I have greatly missed that. Um, I, I like to think of myself as a people person uh, I like to interact with individuals. I think there's a lot to be gained through body language, through uh, the the uh, impression, through facial features. And you know what? Um, I, I don't think there's anything more valuable than a good hug, a warm hug, or or a good handshake in looking someone eye to eye and making that connection. That I, I dearly miss. And we may not be getting that back for a long time and uh my, my own experience is some days you feel zoomed out that you've had yeah. too many meetings and uh you need to get some fresh air and uh, and really miss uh, the, the personal contacts do you think lockdown's changed you as a person at all I think it has made me focus and re-evaluate uh, my priorities. Uh, I, I, I don't see how we can go through this pandemic and not change. Uh, I, I, I think it has made me realize the anxieties associated with it. Uh, but I, I've also realized there was a lot of stuff that I would spend my time worrying on that I'm, I'm not so sure right now is really all that important. I know you've probably heard, don't sweat the small stuff. And at the end of the day, it's all small stuff. Uh, and I think that's what this has revealed is, is my time was being spent on a lot of small stuff. Because I wonder how quickly we'll forget these lessons uh, and just restock the small things back yeah, into our lives again. You know, the, the longer it lasts, the less the likelihood we'll forget it. That's the, that's the double-edged sword of this. Yeah. Uh, but but I, I hope we utilize it as as a good reflection. And I hope that the benefits we've gained from it, that that will be uh, I hope they truly will be sustained. Have you found time to do reflecting or reading while you've been locked down? I have. I have. I've actually gone back and I've, I've read a couple of uh, my favorite uh, readings. I've actually been reading a little bit more. Some of the things that I may have not spent a lot of time on, whether it's personal reading or whether it's uh, professional reading, I'm finding that I actually have time to do that now just because of some of the, the time gains associated with the pandemic. Have you got a book to recommend? I do. I'll tell you, I've, I, I, I just finished it and it was actually done in the state of Georgia by Wising Up Listening Project and sharing the burden of repair. And it was talking about reentry after mass incarceration. And, and what I really love about this book, it talked about all facets of the criminal justice system in regards to incarceration. It talked to probation, it talked to parole, it talked about service delivery individuals, it talked about those individuals that we are supervising. And it is probably one of the most honest, frank discussions, and that's what I look at the book as a discussion of the challenges we face uh, with the criminal justice system, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, it's an it's a excellent read, it really is. 
Okay, well, we'll put, our, we'll, we'll put a reference up on our website and we'll, we'll expect sales to shoot through the roof <laughs> uh, and, and hope that it travels uh, 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 to a, a European as well as an American yeah. audience. Well, I don't, I don't gain a thing from it other than the <laughs> fact that I, I, I really enjoyed it and I thought it painted a very good picture. All okay, give us, give, us, give us the reference again. Uh, this is uh, Sharing the Burden of Repair, yeah. Reentry After Mass Incarceration. And it was a project done by a wising up listening project. Sounds like we can't afford to miss that. Now, I mean, while you've been doing your reflection, have you had a, a question or a challenge that you would like to share with other leaders? I, I think I am always struggling and, and reflecting on, am I spending enough time giving the necessary attention to my teammates, to those that were supervising, to myself, and certainly to my family. And this pandemic has, has made that even more of a challenge because those things should always be important. And those questions uh, should always be asked by leaders. Are you given enough of your time and energy? And now, uh, it's not so much about proportion, it's about amount. Uh, that's, that's what I find challenging from a, from a leadership perspective. There's a danger, isn't there, if, if you talked about the small things and the stuff that gets in a way that you can spread yourself too thinly. Easily. Uh, and the other thing that also I think is hard is that if you're used to, say, working in a team and you you're either in the same office or you see each other a lot. There's lots of business that you can react just by being around each other. Right. And you, you've got to attend that. Uh, relational exchanges just are, yes. you've got to put time into that in a way that you can't just if you're sharing a building. Yeah, that's right. It's it's got to be a focused investment. That's yeah, the yeah. Way a quick the quick coffee is not quite so easy if you're <laughs> 150 miles away, is it? No, that that's exactly right. Not or if there's an ocean between us, like there is today. That, that makes it even more difficult. Okay, so your challenge really is: Are you spending enough time with the team, maybe on yourself, and also with your family? So right, we'll, we'll pass that on. John, and what, what, go on. One thing I did want to mention that when you talk about changing uh, the profession, here, here's one other that I think is a very important observation. Okay. We really started focusing on the utilization of our, our county jails and locking people up for technical violations. Uh, the jails were in a unique position where, uh, you know, it, they, they, it was unsafe during the pandemic, perhaps. Uh, and the last thing they needed was us to contribute to it. And what we found is a lot of times we were, my phrase, slow walking technical violations and perhaps giving individuals an extra second or third chance uh, regarding technical violations. And I am interested in seeing uh, that it, it, how positive that is, because I do believe it's it's making a difference. It's forcing us to work with them more instead of just using a custodial setting as a quick fix or a punishment tool. So I am interested in in seeing how that is fair. If it's unsafe to be in a prison, let's slow walk more people in the community. And that sounds like a right. that sounds like a challenge. And if, you, if we can work with people better in the community, well, let's, let's hold on to them. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Right. Well, we're getting towards the end of our time, Michael. So thanks a lot. But have you got any um, COVID-19 advice for your NAEP membership as we sign off? I, I do. Stay positive. Know that this too shall pass. And know that you're not in it alone. Well, that sounds like a really good way of finishing our time together. Thanks very, very much indeed uh, for sh spending this time, Michael. Uh, I also want to thank our listeners for tuning in. I hope that they will stay safe and hope also that you can join us another time. I want to say goodbye and thank you very much. These podcasts are available on your normal provider via iTunes or Google and under INCJ.
podcasts. Goodbye and thanks again. You have been listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. To find out more, go to our website at criminaljusticenetwork.net or follow us on Twitter at INTCJ Network.